African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to what can only be described as an extremely blustery dawn. This is Safari Live. you happen to find yourselves on this uh, on this well fairly unpleasant morning really so far I'm hoping that it's going to improve with some exceptional animal sightings my name is James Henry and on camera today we've got Rian very nice there are the sort of um, dive sign saying uh, he's okay everything's a-okay and we're going down hopefully to find Karula's cubs down in the south um, questions? Yes, please talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live. Questions at wilder.tv. If there is a lot of wind noise, I'm sorry about this, but this is really unusual kind of weather for this area. It feels almost coastal. And we're all a little bit frantic because, well, the wind caused trouble during the night, blew things about, and uh, a couple of radios weren't working. The old chassis bent. We seem to be okay now, and we're out, and we're doing our best to find you some animals. Now, there's a cloud. I'm not sure if Rion's going to actually be able to see it. You aren't, are you, Rion? Yeah, well, just those top ones there. Sorry about the roof. We are obviously a bit worried about rain. But you can just see those clouds moving quite quickly across the sky. But there is interspersed, of course with bits of clear sky and a little bit of pink so maybe we'll get some sun today the weather report said we would the weather report is normally a great deal of untruth anyway time will tell it's quite nippy too it's probably about oh I don't know I wouldn't say it's much more than 16 degrees 61 Fahrenheit with the wind chill it does midsummer I feel like I'm walking along a beach. Apparently there is some packet loss on the on the screen. I don't know what that means, but I think it means that you're not seeing a picture quite as good as normal, so we do apologize for that. I think it's probably got quite a lot to do with the weather. But fear not. Petrus Brat is on the job. Oh, there's a little bit of gold off to the south there in the sky. That's quite nice to see. Maybe we'll find a sheltered ray of sun in about an hour's time. And therein we shall sit, cupping our hands over a warm drink. Well, no, that won't be for the next three hours or so. Oh, this really is quite strange. Right, Myron you've already seen, he's on pre-show today, and Taylor will hopefully, I think she'll probably be in the tent rather than out on foot in this weather, but we'll see a bit later. Good morning everyone, my name is Byron, and on camera with me this morning is Dave. It's great to have you with us. Fine today, we are going to try our best though as we always do um, I as I mentioned earlier just briefly in the in the pre-show drive it's very difficult to find animals in weather like this a lot of them do look for shelter so it it might be a bit tricky this morning but we'll, as I said we'll do our best and um, we'll probably find something to speak about even if it's just stories <laughs> I'm using the spotlights a little bit because it is still dark slightly dark because of the cloud cover so I'm hoping to spot something and not lose my cap so I've got to hold the cap 
hold the spotlight, hold the steering wheel. It's um, multitasking at its best. Uh, this is actually it's it's for a game drive. That, that that's a better way of putting it because if you were at home or or in camp and you're sipping on some coffee or hot chocolate the wind blowing it's actually not bad now have a look at this this is a tree <laughs> now I wonder I think this may have been pushed over by the wind all the wind that we've had I don't think this was elephant I'll tell you why and have a look at this okay let me just drive around here quickly now I'll tell you why I say I don't think it is elephant because uh, the um, the trees that have fallen over or this tree that's fallen over nothing has fed on it I can't see branches that have been broken off or fed on this is purely wind I believe. clean snap clean break like some uh, uh, some termites got in there perhaps and that tree just could not withstand the wind Excuse me a second. James is calling. Uh, copy that, James. I'm going to work the western section a little bit, and then I don't know. We'll see what we can find. Um, so as I was saying yesterday, while I was in the tent, the wind blew, and a huge marula actually snapped completely and fell over. And we just heard the crash from the tent. Sure. <laughs> Sorry everybody, this is a bit... <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can get some more volume here. There we go. Alright. I'm just having a look around. Perhaps we find tracks of a pride of lions moving about. That would be great. <clears throat> Thank goodness I had my jacket with me. <laughs> Sarah, you say I mustn't go away. Blow away. Oh, blow away. <laughs> you see the cops? I was. <laughs> I was wondering, Sarah, where, where, did, where was I going to go? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, Sarah, th thank you. I hope I don't blow away. It, it's, I might just. I might just. Now, I, um, I was saying, thank goodness I bought my jacket. Because if I didn't, it probably would have been very cold. For the day, um, for our viewers on a safari, I think perhaps from today I shall start tip of the day. And I think today's tip of the day is when you time of year it is. So if you're going in summer, always take a jacket just in case. Going in winter, take more jackets. Um, have a hat. It is summer because it does get very, very hot out here, as you know. But always be prepared. So let me know actually if if you would like me to start something like that. The tip of the day, and I'll see how well.
of the wind. And I'll, I've mentioned it a few times is how the um, the wind is a benefit for the predators and makes it easier for them to hunt. So. And the reason for that is because it masks their scent and makes it difficult for the prey species to hear them and to see them or to smell them. So um, we might be lucky and find the Unkahuma prime kill, but who knows? I'm to search around and see. Let's head back to my friend James and see what his plan is and for an update. Well, we found some impala. We're at Treehouse Dam and they're still sort of asleep. They're in bed. You can see the one on the left, still fast asleep. He's a late riser. His friends just got up and to the left of them, their friends just got up. And their friend, Jippo the Egyptian geese, is also up and about seeing what he can find to eat on this blustery morning. Now. If we come across to the dam wall, you can see there those thorn bushes on the bottom left hand side of your screen. And you might be able to see that m many of them have blown off and into the water. Including Treehouse Dam. It's very much a of a puddle, really. Hopefully some vegetation will grow around it soon. Yeah, Julie, I'm afraid <laughs> with this wind your question came across as follows. Have you ever been to Siberia in the dark? Let's try again, Lou. Uh. Tornadoes? No. Right, okay, Judy, you say, have we ever had tornadoes in this area? No, we haven't. I think you'll find that the ground is rather too undulating. I think you have to have fairly flat landscape for there to be tornadoes. And ooh, that being the case, there are places in South Africa where tornadoes happen. Up in the Free State, which is on the high ground, tornadoes from time to time. Very seldom though. Uh, it's really quite an event when they happen. There was a very famous one that happened yest yesterday, that happened last year, and that happened, it ripped through Pretoria, or a section of Pretoria, a very sort of low-income housing area of Pretoria called, what was it called? It's, was it Mama Lodi it went through? Dipslut and another area. Okay. And Tembisa. Tembisa is the word I'm going for. And that was, yeah, was quite devastating for a number of people. It just cut a swathe through them. But we don't get them anything like you do in the sort of Midlands of America. Tornadoes like that. Nor do we get hurricanes, of course, because hurricanes only occur in the Western Atlantic. We do get cyclones, however. And um, that cyclones that go well, that take place off the Mozambican Channel do sometimes hit us here. And if it's very far, 120 kilometers as the crow flies, which is about mm, say 85 miles. So we can be affected by the weather conditions. At the moment, I think this is just a nasty front coming through. You may have noticed I've become even shorter during the last 10 minutes while you were away, and that's because I've had to take one of the blankets I sit on out from under my bottom and put it over my leggies. My leggies were getting cold. We are now in the area where Hosanna was yesterday. Kerry, I think your question was uh, I think it probably will keep some of the animals in hiding. Certainly 
uh, interestingly, when we used to view rhino, of course, rhino would be almost impossible. Same, they'll go down and like the feeling of the wind on their skin. And no hair, of course. But there's very little protection for them. Then impala and that sort of thing, they will have probably come out eventually onto the clearings. They will spend time in thick stuff, but they need to go out and eat. And so if there's green grass out on the clearings, they will come out onto the clearings. That termite mound there, the evening. Let me just have a quick, I know he's not there, but one must just look, just for peace of psychological mind. Yes, he's not there. I'm expecting that neither of the cubs will be around here. I'm expecting that Karula, by now, especially given the conditions that they were last night, would have come to fetch them and has probably killed something for them. So we will keep an eye out on the tracks, but let's just look. There's a pan up ahead here where they spent most of yesterday. So while I look around here, Byron is with some antelope, um, very much similar to the ones we just had at Treehouse Dam. Now, I'm glad I managed to find this impala, and this just proves my theory correct. Have a look. Usually we used to see them out on the clearings. Now they're not far from the clearing, but they're in the trees. You see that? Look how nervous they are. The wind is blowing viciously, and all of them are huddled very, very close together and in, the, in between the trees trying to look for shelter. So you see everyone, this is how animals, and we get these questions often, how do animals cope with the climate change or the weather? Now we can see, look how these impala all huddled together and staying in the tree thickets and hopefully trying to get out of the wind. You see, they're not too happy about it either, and they'll be on high alert in case there are any predators around. I thought I saw a leopard blow past earlier. <laughs> Some some lambs in there too. It's a, a whole whole herd of impala lambs, the males, the females, all in there together. Yeah, I can, they are so skittish. Every time the wind picks up and blows a little heavily. Now, M A, you say that the wind blows like this in Boston all the time. I'm terribly sorry to hear that. Boston does not sound like a place that I'd like to visit if the wind blows like this. this uh, no. <laughs> now, MA, I'm just kidding, but, um, but it must be fairly unpleasant if the wind blows like this all the time. Now, uh, our coastal areas, in some coastal areas of South Africa, it is uh, renowned for windy conditions, especially Port Elizabeth which is right down the south, almost southeastern part of South Africa. And, um, and it's, uh, it's known as the Windy City because of these windy conditions that it experiences. And I always laugh when, when you do arrive at the airport. It's a very small airport. As soon as you walk out, the trees are all basically doing this. <laughs> it's usually very, very windy in Port Elizabeth. Ruth, <laughs> you say, imagine a leopard just did fly past in the wind, heads and tails and <laughs> legs all in the air, what would the impala do? Well, um, <laughs> I mean, if that ever did happen, which it's highly unlikely it did, 
I'm assuming if the leopard flew past, the Impala wouldn't be too far flying with it if the wind was that strong. All right, now, I am on a road called Sandy Patch, and a friend of mine who used to work in the... ...as a guy, always used to say to me, don't... So, Chris, you bet this morning. Mom Jack, thank you for your comment. And Giraffe and Honey Badger. Now, if I can see Honey Badger this morning, I will be so happy. I have not seen a Honey Badger for years. I don't why they just they they hide from me but um, but the truth is it's my favorite animal I absolutely love honey badgers just don't see them very often so I'm really hope that we get to see a honey badger this morning and it's funny I think uh, and I mean I, I don't know if this is very true but I've found that sometimes when you walk, when you are in the bush and you're f so focused on trying to see something, it doesn't happen. Uh, it's, you know, it, people can come out and say, we need to see giraffe, we need to see giraffe, and you just don't find a giraffe. When you eventually forget about it, you'll spot one, and then around every corner after that will be a giraffe. It's amazing how it happens, and it's happened to me a few times. <laughs> uh, Lou says she'd be surprised if the giraffe haven't all blown over in the wind. It reminds me of a funny story, actually. I was about being on safari which you know is understandable for your first time if you, you don't know and I, I always try and reassure my guests and make sure they're comfortable no matter what we are seeing or where we are um, because you don't want them to have a bad experience because they are a bit nervous or scared and um, we were driving around and they said that you know they'd love to see giraffe but um, the, the lady was a bit nervous of the giraffe and I said why and she said no well she wasn't sure what all the animals ate so she you know she was worried about the wildebeest and worried about the giraffe and um and she said you know aren't the giraffe dangerous and what because again she didn't know now, just hang on a second i've spotted some water back let's see if they stop now again what might happen there they go They're just running off because be moving away from us probably because as I said the wind affects their sense of smell and their hearing so animals do become a lot more skittish and nervous in windy conditions anyway back to my story this lady was worried about the giraffe I said please don't worry there's absolutely nothing to worry about giraffe purely feed on vegetation they eat leaves of trees so you really don't have to worry it couldn't have been five minutes later and I drove around the corner and there was this massive horns sticking out of its mouth and it was chewing on the impala skull. Now, we know, we know they do this. They chew on bone. Um, it's known as osteophagia. They do that because they need the calcium and the phosphorus from the bone. And are renowned for doing it. But... convinced that I was lying to her about everything and that the giraffe actually kill and eat the impala but <laughs> it was such a funny story. you can imagine coming around the corner the impala skull the mouth and these two big horns sticking out of the giraffe's mouth anyway so <laughs> the, the I'm not from Sydney's Dam. I'm just going to have a look at 
it there quickly, but while I do that, I'm almost there. While I do that, let's head back to James and see how the wind is treating him. It's blowing what few hairs I have in my head clean up. Anyway, um, we did find tracks of the leopards, or certainly at least one of them heading south into Little Gari, so I'm not very hopeful that the little ones are still around. Anyway, we're going to keep looking around here and then we'll head slowly off towards the east for a while. This being a blustery day is unlikely to be particularly game rich and so it is the time for stories I suppose. And wonderful story I'm sure Byron told you about his terrified guest. I had have had a number of terrified guests in my time, one of which, or one group of which, East End of London, and they were very nervous about every And I remember stopped the car north in Ngala, which is about 60 kilometers north of where we are now. And it was a nice open area, lovely sunset sort of scene. There was a jackal sitting way back, way off in the distance. Well, of course, to a human being on foot is entirely harmful. And I said, well, let's get out and have a drink. I said, we can stop and have a sundowner here. I said, well, you're not going get out of the car. Are you mad? It's dangerous out there. I said, no, it's not dangerous. I mean, really, we know we do this every every day. We're not getting out of the car, they said. You've got to be crazy. In fact, let's go home. Well, he's had enough of this. And I, they said, um, uh, we don't understand how people can come on holiday here and, uh, and, not, and not be terrified. I think Ibiza is where we want to go next time. This is, this is ridiculous. So I said, but you know, I mean, people come and get married here. You, it, people find it very romantic. Romantic? This is terrifying, they say. This animal's all over the place, want to kill you. We don't want to be around here anymore. No, no, not get out of the car. Drive us home. We'll have a drink there and I don't think we'll be back. It's not for everybody. So that's the story of my terrified guests from the east end of London. Quite. As Louise says, Africa is not for sissies. I suspect the East End of London isn't for sissies either. Laura, you're wondering, of course, how a and what I did was I was in the mountains. I've told you a number, many of you, the story before. But I climbed up this mountain, or just a ridge, one evening on my own in the Drakensberg, way down south in Natal. And I just had an experience where uh, something spoke to me in the wild. And it was while I was watching, it was August, and while I was watching the sort of very late winter wind blow through the thatching grass. And the thatching grass there grows really long to about sort of five and a half feet, up to seven feet in some places. Time of the year, it's sort of golden copper colour, especially when the quintessential African sunset is going down behind it. And there was just the way that the grass moved, and I remember the sound of the silence and the smell of the dust. And that was the first time that I thought, yeah, there's something in this, and I think I prefer this to being in the city. Anyway, I didn't think much of it for a long time thereafter. I did go off and I studied pretty much biology when I went to university. And I didn't really know what I was going to do with that. And when I'd finished my degree, I thought I was going to become a musician. Because that's what one does if one has spent a lot of money doing a biological degree. One decides to be a musician. But before I could decide to be a musician, I had a rather strong-willed girlfriend at the time and she told me that we were going off to the bush to become game rangers and I didn't really know what a game ranger did 
I thought maybe he counted grasses or animals or something like that. I didn't know what a game drive was. And I found myself on a training course soon thereafter. And mercifully she, uh, well it was decided basically that her people skills needed a bit of work before she could guide high paying travellers from around the world. So she was sent packing. How they decided I had the requisite people skills I find mystifying to this day. Anyway, I remained on the training course and the rest as they say is history. I found it a new world of wonderful discovery and I haven't really looked back. I have been back to the city for a five year stint in the interim where I became a musician and a guitar teacher but I did find it quite trying to be in the city especially in the winter time. Here are some impalas. It seems that impalas are the only animals that Byron and I are able to find except I think he had some these ones anyway. This bachelor herd actually spends quite a lot of time in this clearing. And just I do apologize for that pole, there's really nothing we can do about it. It is... This wind is going to preclude any... ...pleasant... ...with the wind. ...much time for us, but we'll see. There will also be a certain amount of frolicking about in order to warm up the animals. Now that chap I would put at roughly two and six weeks. It's quite a specific age, but you can see his horns have closed. First experience, probably his first rut this year as a testosterone fuel fueled male. And be in for a fairly nasty time. That's because he's not big enough quite yet to fight for mating rights and the big So a fairly difficult time for him coming up. Red? You're also wondering about the wind and that seems to be the theme of our drive today you say does it become difficult for predators or prey to run no i don't think so i think they run just as easily but they do you know they run the risk of running into something they wouldn't want to like a pride of lions for example smell sight hearing is all compromised i suppose not so much sight smell and hearing are all compromised eventually once it's decided that they can't stay in thick bush forever they come out into the clearings to feed and this bachelor herd has been around here for some time and they're not territorial so clearly there's quite a lot of good grass for them to eat and that's why they're knocking about here right, I think I'm going to turn around and go back up the other way And to keep you posted, Taylor apparently running some repairs on the tent. I'd forgotten about how well it's in a precarious position in this sort of wind. And so she's just going to have to fix a few things before she joins on account of this wind. It's a little bit dangerous to walk in weather like this. I mean, you, you could walk around, around quarantine clearings or through these clearings, but for the same reason as it's dangerous for animals to go running through the thick in this kind of weather it's pretty dangerous for us and it's just because it's all possible to hear well what's going on and our sense of hearing massively important when we're on foot out here have a quick look at the mountains there There we go. It's quite a nice look at them and you can see of the sky. You say how much of them are autobiographical? 
Um, they're an amalgam of stories, and the characters are amalgams of people that I've met, so it's all kind of very loosely based on characters that I have met or formed from the people I've met. And f some of the stories are autobiographical and some of them are just made up. Or stories that I've heard from other people. And if you are wondering, I know a number of you have very kindly asked if you can get the books in hard copy in the United States. Uh, there is a plan afoot to make that happen from our publishers here. So as soon as it does, I will keep you posted. It's quite an amusing scene behind us. Rion, there's a magpie shrike trying desperately to hang on to that bush. Look at this poor thing. <laughs> If that magpie shrike lets go of that Tamburti tree, it will end up in southern Zambia within about 10 seconds, I imagine. Jared, while we look at that poor chap holding on for dear life, you say, have I ever had a guest go rogue and just get out of the car? Uh, well, a number of guests displayed some fairly roguish behaviour, but I did have a guest once who not was it didn't go rogue from the car but went rogue from the camp a russian and this russian decided that he and his girlfriend were quite capable of looking after themselves and they took themselves off for a walk and they were found sort of oh i don't know two kilometers out of camp wandering about in the bush felt just enjoying themselves and um, he was given fairly stern words told to return to the camp have a vodka, and uh, just have a relax and game drive. That's a poor bird. It's a juvenile. You can see its tail not quite at the length it's going to be. It's an adult, and so probably experiencing its first really nasty windstorm. Just calling a bit forlornly. We now have a problem with the starter motor. It's alright, it seems to have started. There's another one over there, but we're not going to stop for that one. We'll carry on going and see if we can't pick something else up. Perhaps Shadzo will be around. But perhaps not. Something that we have to prepare for. Wondering if I've ever been so annoyed that I've imagined strangling a tourist. Uh, no, look, Justin, I'm not. Don't really have a propensity to homicide. So no, I've. I never really wanted to strangle a guest before. Um, I've certainly wanted to slap one or two upside the head and uh, tell them to go away and never come back using very bad words and that is normally you know 90% of the time that's been because I've been in a bad mood and the reason that guiding becomes so exhausting for people other than people like Byron who just loves people and he loves being around people but for someone like me it becomes tiring because people just ask the same stuff and that's fine. Why shouldn't they? They're coming out on holiday. They're coming out on adventure to Africa. And so 90% of the time when I was being irritated with guests uh, or by having to bite my tongue, it was just because it was a sort of personality fault on my side. So, I mean, by and large, tourists coming to Africa because of where Africa is, they're pretty well educated. They're, you know, they're not, they're not imbeciles for, most, for the most part. And so the, there were very few times when I really felt that a guest was uh, actually just a big fat idiot and needed to needed to go home fairly quickly. And uh, one of one of them was uh, again, funnily enough, 
from the East End of London. Now, now I'm not having a go at the East End of London. The other guests I told you about were very pleasant people. They were just terrified out here. But there was one chap, and I've told you this story before a few times, about uh, a guy who came out from the East End of London and demanded to see a kill. And, you know, I did my... In fact, his, and his first guy didn't show him a kill on his first drive, so he demanded a new ranger, and I was sent down. I mean, that was a profoundly strange decision on the part of the general manager to send me down to deal with guests who wanted to see a kill. And he said, right, well, you, you're our new guide, and, and, well, we want to see a kill. And his girlfriend slash wife slash um, uh, paid travel companion, not sure what she was, was very confused generally by things. I'm not sure that she had bargained for the safari idea. I think he'd sort of taken her out to Africa to impress her. And um, shall we say that she'd been surgically modified in various ways. And so it was very clear that her priorities lay with trying to look spectacular rather than with trying to find Africa's most iconic animals. And this fellow demanded from the time that I drove him until the time he left two days later to see a kill and he left complaining bitterly that no one had bothered to find him something like that. There's a drongo also holding on. Oh, that's so irritating. There it is, it's still there. As we stopped the thing flapped up and gave it a fright. But there he is, now he's okay. You can see him wobbling there. Now for a bird, that is not actually as difficult as it might look. It's not the same as it is for you and I if we were hanging onto a tree, trying desperately not to blow into southern Zimbabwe. Because their feet, of course, clamp over the branches automatically. The tendons mean that they, when they're perching like that, they're not actually using any muscles. They're purely just holding on and as they land there's a tendon in the foot that pushes to the clock or clamps the feet shut. And so perching is their life. They're just sort of trying to maintain balance. It's not actually very tiring, I don't think. But I don't think this wind will persist for more than a day, and I certainly hope it won't. I thought it would drop during the night. I thought it was very strange, actually. Right, Byron has managed to make his way all the way along the northern boundary. I hope that he's going to tell us that there have been some tracks of some lions. I suspect he's not, but we'll ask him at Bufusuk Dam. Now, James, I've searched the northern boundary with nothing. Nine tracks. All right, well, there we are. So, obviously, Byron had a wonderful time there. The long told you a lengthy story about his lion tracking excavates, and now you find yourself back with us three nanoseconds later. Sorry about that. A couple of issues with the signal. And I just want, I'm a bit worried about my little. The microscope is okay, there's power to the tent, so shortly, with any luck, everything will be okay there. Phew! Ah, and Peter says there's no damage to my little tent, that's a great relief. Everything is okay there. Right, we're heading basically from clearing to clearing, seeing what is in them. So far, Impala only. Lions, of course, will be in thick bush. Buffalo will be in thick bush. I'd be very happy to find a buffalo being eaten by some lions in some thick bush today, so that I too could be in thick bush. As opposed to having the skin blown off.
This is, I mean, I can't tell you how bizarre this weather is. Right, we'll turn off and have a look here. Louise reckons we should do kite safaris, fly kites on quarantine clearings. Louise, I'm not sure that that's the best idea you've ever had. I think it'd be quite difficult to film. But certainly we should try it, maybe. By this stage, I'm up for anything. Let's Let's hoping to see maybe shadow lurking underneath a tree. Let's go across to Red Dam. We're not too far from there on Arethusa. Let's see if there isn't something across the water there. It's quite a sheltered drainage system. Which may provide us with some kind of animal life. In the meantime, oof, let's have a look at some flowers. All right, we're actually not going to look at the flowers. We're going to link to Byron and try and get an update from him again. So I'm sorry about that. I think it's uh, just all this wind and the weather. It's going to make it, I think, fairly difficult for us this morning. Um, so no update, unfortunately, just yet. I did check the northern break, uh, northern boundary, to see if we had any signs of the lion prides coming back. Um, or rather a lion pride than Kuhuma pride, but um, nothing just yet. And the soil is very soft from all the rain that we had yesterday, so it would be easy to see the tracks. Nothing just yet. Oh, hang on. Some beautiful birds. Is it sitting just in that tree at the back? There we go. The African hoopoo, look at that. I'm surprised they actually took off in the pit. Look, holding on for dear life on that branch. Yet, when I was young, this was my favorite, favorite bird. Um, and I say when I was young, when I was um, growing up in junior school, and um, we had a project the one day, we had to draw draw our favorite birds and I lived in a part of Johannesburg where the bird life was very very good and we used to get these African hoopoos in our garden and that for me was my favorite uh, favorite bird so I attempted to draw it. I'm not an artist however. <laughs> not nearly as good as James. <laughs> Having a look. When you get to these junctions, it's always a good idea to have a look around for little tracks, see if animals have crossed through an area. But nothing yet, nothing yet. Anyway, I think while it's probably going to start warming up at some point, and I think we might then get some more movement from animals. I'm hoping. Uh, James was talking about uh, funny stories with guests and he's got a lot of them he, and he um, he describes them so well. I must be honest, I think I, I've forgotten some of the stories with all the guests that I've driven around. I wish I remembered all of them. But um, but uh, James managed, I mean he put a lot of them in his book, a, com a combination of stories really. And he put them with different characters. Sorry, my, my hat's going to fly off soon in this wind. But um, his books are very, very funny. I, I have, I've really enjoyed them. Quite... <laughs> don't... Uh, don't... that. But... Uh, he never ceases to amaze me. 
Now, Aaron, you wanted to know, have I ever driven any high-profile guests uh, or celebrities or anything? Um, uh, not, not, re not really. I, um, I once drove Paul Allen, the founder of, of Microsoft, or co-founder of Microsoft. Um, I drove him. He came to London Ozzy one year. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the highest profile guest I've, I've driven. And again, what I mean, to me, and and I, I honestly believe this. Every every guest for me, I treat the same. You know, the guests pay a lot of money to come on safari and. It doesn't matter who you are, you, I believe you all deserve the same experience. So, and I think most, most lodges feel that too, um, especially a lot of the lodges that we go to. Um, you can say you're a VIP or whatever, it doesn't matter. Everybody gets the same treatment and the treatment is very, very good. So I believe in that and, um, and I treat all my guests the same doesn't matter who they are I'll go out of my way to make sure they have an amazing experience because uh, because like I say people travel from all over the world to come on safari sometimes it could be a once in a lifetime experience and I think you know that, that there's something to be said about that and you you want people to have an amazing experience an amazing memory um, and hopefully come back one day Some more Impala ahead. Also staying very close together. Look how big those little lambs are getting already. Isn't that amazing? Just two months old. Michael, I, you, you know what, I, I think you've noticed something which does happen um, usually in, in bad weather like this. It, it appears as if all the impala lambs are situated in the center, center of the herd so that the adults may keep a lookout and keep the lambs safe. And generally that does happen, but, but I mean, um, I, and I think again it's purely when, when the weather is like this. Otherwise. On clear days, we've seen how they spread out and move around. So, so it is very, very different. Um, I think depending on the weather that you have, very adult and Michael. I think uh, I think the youngsters do get some cold in parlour. Oh, there's a male, listen to him snorting, he's running around us. He might come back, let's just hang on a second. Uh, and he's just chasing a female for some reason, that's what the snorting was that you could hear. Uh, maybe trying to either chase her away from the herd, if he might be picking up that she, she possibly didn't have a young, yeah, they came. He'll just be, there they go, there they go. And just ran and joined the herd. Maybe she, she wandered off and he was possibly just trying to herd her back to the herd and keep her close. Maybe just a dominant male that's uh, looking after this herd. Now, Taylor, I think, has got the tent up and running. And has she got a tulip that she'd like to do? <laughs> Good morning, welcome. We managed to salvage the tent. It was in bits and pieces, lying all over the ground due to, well, the wonderful wind that we've had over the past 
12 hours. Now, good morning again. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me is Greg. And, well, I've just noticed that he's quite tall, and him and... Well, him and Brian obviously must knock their heads a lot on these lights as I'm looking up at them. Now, earlier, you saw this beautiful bird. An hoopoo. And I think it is such a special bird. And I'm so happy that you saw one. And I feel so sad today for all the birds because they're all, well, holding on for dear life. But as you can see, I love that description. Rich cinnamon plumage and I think that that describes the coloration of the, uh, the hoopoos uh, very well. Now I have a little poem for you. So I had a guest, uh, I had many, when I was guiding down in the Eastern Cape we had a, a lot of guests from Germany and one of my favorite nationalities to, to actually guide because I really enjoy the sort of uh, dry sense of humor that they have. It was fantastic and I was desperate to try and learn their wonderful language. I think it sounds beautiful in my ears. It's it, anybody that could uh, well speak like that could woo me, and I'm just teasing. You won't, but it's. I think it's a beautiful language, nonetheless. So I made a very poor attempt at trying to learn it, and the way that I thought that I'd try and learn it was learn nursery rhymes. So are you ready for one? about the African hoopoe. Now, I'm, I'm just going to give you a fair amount of warning now. It's probably not going to be 100% correct in the uh, pronunciation, but I'm going to give it a bash. And well, I can only improve from him. Are you ready, Craig? You've got to repeat it after me. He's nervous now. He's panicking. He's going to make a run for it. Right. De wieder hopf, de wieder hopf, de klaut der Frau, der Blumentopf. And well, basically, it's the story of an African wood hoopoe that knocks over a flower pot. That's literally what it means. So it was actually a very naughty uh, wood hoopoe. Now, should we go and have a quick look at it outside? Let's do that. I want to keep this open. So we'll use a piece of grass to close that. Out we go. Now, Craig, watch your step here. We've got sandbags holding the tank down. It's crazy out here at the moment. But at least the sun is coming out, so I suppose we sort of have that going for us, which is quite nice. Whee! And over the ropes I've gone. You'll see that I need to need to get used to uh, the new setup out here. Literally, come and have a look. Craig, should we show them the tent? So basically, if you have a look at all of these poles here, all of this was completely blown over. Is it a bit tight? Do, you need, do we need some more? I'll be back, Craig. Stay there, Craig. You're hooked. The tent has got you. <laughs> there we go. Got Craig needs some more wire. He hasn't got a very long lifeline. But basically, we came here and this whole part, the front part of the tent was on the ground. I was so worried that all James's artifacts, all his skulls and everything were all going to be on the floor, the monitors. I was a little bit panicked, a little bit concerned, of course. But then we managed to salvage it. Uh, it's, it's not our finest work, but we tried to do it as quick as possible. But it's very windy. And I know Byron is also talking about the roof tree that had blown over. I can't see the marula tree, but I'm sure it's here somewhere. And I think that we're going to see, as we drive around on the property, quite a few trees that have actually been, been blown over in, well, in last night's wind. And I'm cold, cold now. It's freezing out here. I think we should go, let's go back inside the tent. It's too chilly to be out here. I think we need some coffee, Craig. What do you think? Coffee? What are we going to do inside? I've got my coffee and my mug. What, what are we going to have a look at? Now, I think it's going to be particularly difficult to, of course, try and find uh, some... I mean, and let me go back because it's a bit dark here too. To try and find some insects because you saw the birds were struggling to hold on to a branch. You watched that chameleon last night almost... Uh, sorry. I'm sorry, Louise. I'm pressing buttons. I didn't mean to press buttons there. It's very... I'm sure it would have made it out alive. So... I don't know how many insects are going to be out and about. And I know Byron has been testing the microscope out, so hopefully I'm going to go out and I'm going to collect a couple more different species of specimens of grasses and we can have a look at their inflorescence under the microscope, which will be interesting because there's been a couple that have got some beautiful little flowers on them. So we're definitely at some point going to have a look at those. Careful! Wildebeest. I'm going to also have to retire the wildebeest skull. Well, to the thing because he's been blowing around. He must be a little bit dizzy. I hope you don't get motion sick. Otherwise, it's probably very unwell. 
it's not really alive anymore. I suppose I'm being ridiculous. Okay, well, I'm gonna go out and very quickly collect some grasses that I can put underneath the microscope for you. But I'm gonna send you back across to James and I hope that he's holding down on his hat. There was a And another bird here. Rian says it's back up. He almost got enthusiastic there. I got a bit of a fright. Okay, so there we have the <laughs> shrike. And many of you have been asking about the white crown shrike nest we found yesterday. And it's blown out of the tree onto the ground with two babies in it and their worried parents sitting around. Um, I'm going to go and have a look there again. I warn you though, it is not a pleasant sight. It's quite sad. I don't know if they'll still be alive. Good grief. But before we do that, I'm going to tell you we're going to go home and take this roof off the car because I don't think it's going to rain. And I think we might take off fairly soon if we don't get it off. It's like a big wing. Terry here in Michigan and wondering about the birds and how many species we get. Well, it's by the, what you've seen today, we get two species. The white, the, at least the magpie shrike and the forktail drongo. Oh, maybe the, the hoopoe as well. We get, actually get, Terry, about 250 species here on a yearly basis. And the total list, including all the vagrants that pop through here, probably about 300. So quite a few. Righty, let's keep going along here. We're on Arethusa at the moment. We did check Red Dan. There was nothing there, but Byron's got one of the most exciting birds that we get here. I do indeed, James. It is an African harrier hawk that has just disappeared um, into the tree line there. It was sitting in trees close to us. Um, but uh, the wind, the wind was a bit much for it, and it uh, it took off and and just flew flew away. Let's see, we might be able to see it again. Um, I'm hoping that. It it finds some nests. It's always interesting. haven't found any sign of animals yet, or well, predators rather. Just seen a few more impala, that was it. But also huddled closely together. I've got a song stuck in my head this morning, I think because of the weather. I don't know if it's... <laughs> Should I attempt to sing, Dave? Yeah, how does it, go? <laughs> it seems to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind. <laughs> I wonder what James James will have to say about my singing. <laughs> Probably just shake his head in shame. <laughs> Chris Rogue, you should you say I should go where the wind blows me. Well at the moment it's all over the show, so I'm not sure. <laughs> very carefully we're not far we're just on the edge of a drainage line just off to our right and uh, the, the more white is down here so I'm having a close look around perhaps we get a sign of some animals maybe a leopard or something hiding down in the drainage line looking for shelter looking for um, potential prey Mary Ann, you said, I'm the wind beneath your wings. Thank you, Mary Ann. 
What uh, what song? Yeah, there's so many songs. <laughs> Wind Beneath My Wings. Oh, I yeah, saw so Kingfisher. <laughs> oh, these beautiful leadwoods. Now, there's a leadwood off to my right. And it is probably one of my favorite trees. This and, and I think a, a jackalberry. Love the jackalberry trees. I'll see if I can find one for you. But the, um, these, uh, these beautiful leadwood trees. And I'm, I'm sure the other guides have spoken about them many times. But I, the reason I love them is just because they, they, to me, they've just got character. And I say that because if you look at the branches, the branches spread out, massive, thick um, strong, strong branches that spread out, and um, and if you see a dead leadwood, they're probably the best trees to photograph in the sunset to get a silhouette of them. They 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 look, uh, I don't know, they just have this wonderful effect with these branches that stand out and they twist and they turn and they all point in different directions. But uh, for me, it's it's one of my favorite trees. It really is. And the amazing thing is a lot of them, I mean, they can stay, well, they live anywhere between, I think it's, I think it's around 500 to 800 years or 1,000 years old, some of them, because they are, and they're just so sturdy, very strong, strong, strong trees. And then also after they die, they can stay standing between 50 and 80 years which is incredible, before they eventually start to um, degrade and, and break apart and fall apart. So it is amazing. Lovely leadwood. Combretum, Combretum imberba. That is the scientific name. Dave, shall we take a stroll down the Mulwati? Maybe out of the wind a little bit. Dan guests and a lot of them actually you know and uh, every every set of guests are different and um, but definitely but you see, you see remember I said the animals will act react um, or act a little bit more skittish this morning as opposed to their normal behavior and it's because of the wind. I mean in Yala you know usually you drive right past them they don't move but I think because of this wind it's uh, making them a bit nervous. Dan getting back to your question um, in many many occasions or moments that have really kind of um, made guiding memorable for me and I had some wonderful moments with guests I hear elephant. I hear elephant up ahead. Let's quickly go have a look. There was a bit of a scream. They didn't sound too happy. Let's go have a look what's going on there. Uh, uh, Dan, um, you know, I'll never forget one one moment. I um, was driving a, a family, and and it had been. It had been the wife's dream to come to Africa. She just always loved the, the African bush and the animals and wanted to see these, these animals and um, never forget the, the first time so well she wanted to particularly see rhino and giraffe and um, I hadn't seen a, a rhino yet and came around the corner and found three rhino for her I'll never forget turning around and she just began to sob Righty, there we are, everybody, a batelier. 
A bandolier that looks about as happy to be attached to that tree as the magpie shrikes we were looking at. Sorry you lost... See, there he goes. Sorry you lost signal there with Byron. I'm not going on with Wendy. I'm pretty sure it's weather. There he goes. Well done, Rian. Sorry about the roof. We are going to go home and take it off, everyone. So that's going to make viewing birds much easier. And that was a juvenile bandolier. With no red leg or red face, which is what the adult battalier has. It was nice to see. There are some impala with little babies. Hello, little babies. And all of them now, of course, doing pretty much as I sort of suspect. Quite an unusual situation this, because there's one male amongst them. There's one male in a nursery herd. Jody, you're wondering about the weaning time for impala lambs and how long they take to wean completely from their mother's milk. I think it's about three months in total but they will start eating grass from they'll probably try and well four to four weeks old actually they'll probably try and nurse until they're at least three months at least until they, yeah I'd say probably that six months would be about the the limit. There's one nursing there, Rion, to the right hand side, far right. Oh, you can just see it there. Oh, let me try and go back. There we go. Oh, there we can see it perfectly. But they will definitely, you've, I'm sure you've seen them all eating or attempting to eat grass even at this early tender stage of their lives. And that is because, of course, they're born so precocial. And now, an impala looks nervous at the best of times, but when the weather is like this, I think they're in a state of abject terror. And there is no ceremony with the, the feeding of the youngster milk. It's very much grab a drink as quickly as you possibly can. Maria, I would have said yes until yesterday. You say, have they finished lambing now? 99% of them have, but Jamie saw a pregnant impala yesterday, quite interestingly, during the live show. She just made a passing comment. I think she was, I mean, I don't know where she was going at the time, but she said, oh, there's an impala and it looks like it's still pregnant, which of course, is very unusual for this time of year. We would expect them to all have lambed some time back. And so you do get anomalies, of course. That's not unusual. And there is, of course, also the second breeding season. So come the end of February, there will be a new crop of lambs born. A very small, probably about 10% impala ewes will give birth then. Righty, Taylor is in the tent, looking under the microscope, and I hope, and I can't wait to use this line, because of course it's used about me so often, she's toasty and warm in her tent. No, James, I'm not toasty and warm. I should have put a long, this is the first time I'm going to say it, I should have put long pants on. Can you believe that? I said those words, they actually came out of my mouth. That is the first and the last time you will ever hear me say that. Now, as promised, I've gone and I've had a look for some grasses that have been growing around. Let me shuffle my chair. And I've got one, which I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pick it up and show you now because you all know how hopeless I am at using the microscope. So we're probably going to leave it on there. And I think in three, two, one, microscope is now. What you are looking at 
Actually, let's let's do a quiz. Yes, I'm not going to tell you because I, I think that you all should be able to guess this grass. It's a very common one. And then I'll give you a clue. It's, it's very, very nice for the animals to eat. It's got lots and lots of nutrients in it. And this will help you guess the grass now. You can see there's a slight bit of movement because the wind is still creeping into to the tent. It's very sticky and you can guess which type of uh, your answers on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to email your answers through. But I'm, I think that uh, grass is a difficult one to do. And I know that I'm, of course, uh, um, pushing the limit a little bit here. But I think that this grass you should all be able to identify. And I, I, yeah, I think that you, you're good enough now. I think you've come, all of you have come such a long way that you'd probably be able to identify grasses better than I can. And I think that's come back to me now, and we'll save that uh, for the quiz. And I hope that in good luck, you can, you can internet search, you can see whoever's going to get it right. So send those answers in quickly. I'll have a look at my tent document in a moment. And I just wanted to show you something because I think it is so precious. Have a look what I've got on screen for you. Look what I did today. I thought, what picture can we put up just to have in the background? What will all make you happy? And I thought that that baby giraffe with its tongue sticking out would be rather adorable and, and suited. Now, I do have a couple of other pieces of grass here. But we will we'll have a look at them. I have to, it takes me time to, um, of course, set, set them all up under the microscope. But we'll get to them. Let's leave them out. This one is a good one. I'll tell you what this one. This is the... it's going to be a difficult one to put under the microscope but I think James has actually had a look at this one before maybe Brent or maybe even Byron yesterday they've all been hitting the grasses hard <laughs> all right and we've got one more which is cat's tail this one is quite a pretty one so I'm look, also looking forward to see some of those sort of the long hairs that are coming off it almost maroon in color remember how James said that you get red green yellow and orange if you're a male and as females, we have of red. This looks like maroon to me. I'm excited. I believe that uh, some of you have answered. I don't show them. I have to check the. T don't let them see. Don't let them see. Right. You can't see yet. I'm. I'm reading the grass quiz. Ooh. Okay. Now. We've got a couple answers. I'm just looking at them very quickly because they're so great. So we've got That's, um, do we get, is there something really? I'm gonna have to Google that because if there's something called frozen grass, then we've got, how do you even say some of these names, Louise? I prefer it when you read them into my, <laughs> dump. Rat Dave. Dump Rat Dave. I had to make sure I was saying that one correct. You say rye grass. Close. Close, close, close. But we've got one. One guess here. Here we go. We've got Judy H. And ne I, I'm not even sure how you say that. Nina? Nina? Yes. Maybe yes. Judy H and Nina. You guys are winner winners. Let's show you. You've guessed right. And you've said, now I've lost my page, of course, but you were right. I've lost my page. Now. It's Erogrostus, love grass. So wonderful. So what we're going to do now is now that we've, so well done, firstly, of course, for Nina and uh, GDH for getting the answer right. GDH, I think you must be on about 300 points now, or you could be on 200 points. If I remember from the previous uh, weeks that we've been playing games and But I don't. This is its process. allows it to stick to animals' coats, to stick to maybe bees and ants as they go off, and then of course they take whatever they need with them, whether they wanted to, or whether it just happened on its own, because of this little mechanism. And I want to taste it. Mm. 
Now this is delicious. You try and pull. I don't know if you've ever done this, and hopefully you try and do it. But you always see the farmers walking around with a piece of grass, and they sort of pull away the, the hard fiber outside, and you get to sort of the end of it, and you. Mm. Mm. So I'll just have to go with some of these. Now, Sally from Oregon, you're wondering, do we know which grasses have the greatest nutrients? Um, there's quite a few. Actually, sticky love grass is not a bad one. A lot of animals, different animals will feed on this. It's quite a, um, um, a good grass to have around and you want it in abundance. Then another really good one is red grass. Red grass is actually favoured by the water buck. So often when you've got big open plains filled with red grass or pockets of red grass amongst, say, sticky love grass, then you'll find quite a few red uh, um, water buck. What is wrong with me? They, they, like, they love that quite a bit. But there's, there's also as many species as there are that have got good nutrients, there are some ones that are absolutely terrible. Now, my absolute worst grass and we used to slash it a lot in Zambia. We actually used to go and cut it out. And I know that they used to try and remove it as well. And oh, the tent is blowing away again. Just make sure that everything is still staying put. We might have to redo a couple of things. But yellow thatching grass is an absolute nightmare. Now, thatching grass is an encroachment species. So it's not that it's not indigenous. It, it does occur down here naturally. And you get, I think it's about three or four different species of thatching grass. But we particularly see the yellow thatching grass down here. And it takes over entire areas. So basically it kills everything else around them. So it doesn't allow for other grasses to grow. You'll see, we, it's actually quite lucky we don't have too much of it. I haven't seen a lot of these pockets, but down south we used to have to get rid of it. And with bush encroaches, acacias, trees can actually be bush encroaches too. Just take over entire areas we used to have. a tractor blades and you sort of just go over that area and you cut it right down and by doing that you then allow an opportunity for the new grasses for the red grasses for the panicum maximum to the aero grasses you allow all of them to come through which have much better grazing value the only thing that uh, thatching grass is really useful for of course is for thatching roofs and that's a very, very uh, typical um, way to sort of roof your house here in South Africa, and because of the, especially because of the, the large Dutch influence we have here. That's a very typical thing. You go to a place called Cape St. Francis down in the east, southeast coast of South Africa. You'll see beautiful uh, white houses with these big thatch roofs, sort of old uh, Dutch style. And it's, it's quite lovely. And then, of course, they're really good at starting fires. Often, when we have big fires in the Great Kruger, and in these areas, they'll start on these massive fields where the thatching grass is, whether it's from lightning or a piece of glass, whatever it may be that caused the fire, it goes up in flames. And it's difficult to, of course, put it out. But I think we've done our grasses for today. We'll see if we can find a couple more interesting ones, but I'm going to go scratching around under some logs. And while I need to go and do that, let's go back to Byron and see how his morning is going. So Taylor, no luck. Um, we heard elephant, but I cannot seem to find them. I uh, saw their tracks crossing through the Mulwati, I think just before I lost you. But um, unfortunately, I just can't find them. I'm, I'm still having a good look around. Um, Dan, getting back to your question earlier, I'm not sure... Um,